Welcome to the dialogues on nonviolence, religion, and the peace. My name is Asher Kaufman, and I am the director of the John B. Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. I think we have about 200 people who are actually zooming in. Uh, so think about this space as very crowded, where <laughs> you can barely get uh, a seat. And uh, welcome to all of you who are watching us uh, from wherever you are. Uh, this event uh, is taking place on the traditional homelands of uh, native peoples, particularly the Pokagon uh, Potawatomi, uh, who have been uh, people, uh, particularly the Pokagon Potawatomi, who have been using this land for education and for other life-giving uh, purposes for thousands of years and continue to do so. As we gather here for this uh, lecture and dialogue, it is important to acknowledge our place, our own place in the story and practices of colonialism and uh, our responsibilities, not only to make this gesture of land acknowledgement, but also to reflect on Notre Dame past, present and future relationship with the Pokagon, the original stewards of this land uh, and to actively pursue ways to amend this uh, relationship. This is the third, 23rd year in which the Kroc Institute hosts uh, this event, which has been enabled by the generous gift of Anne-Marie Yoder and her family. And uh, many, of, many members of the extended now Yoder, Maus, Meyer, and I may have missed now a last name uh, family are uh, here with us. And I thank them for their continued support uh, of this uh, lecture series. The dialogues on uh, nonviolence are one of the signature public events of uh, the Kroc Institute. Uh, in the past, we have had a range of uh, speakers who have led these uh, dialogues, from academics such as uh, Jean Sharp, Erika Chenoweth, and uh, Miroslav Wolf, to practitioners such as uh, Ricardo Esquivia, founding director of uh, Justapas in Colombia, Jean Zaru, the Palestinian peace activist and the uh, author, and Professor Azakaram, the Secretary General of Religions for Peace, the speaker at last year's dialogues. To this list of distinguished, distinguished thinkers and activists, we add now Dr. Tekla Namachanja Wanjala. At these times of global pandemics, Dr. Namachanja Wanjala has had her own challenges of arriving here. So Tekla, if I may, uh, we appreciate very much uh, the efforts that you have made to, and we are really truly grateful that you are here with us uh, uh, physically. Um, we were supposed to move now to a little bit of a more formal presentation of uh, the speaker. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we're unable to do so. I will very briefly, again, I guess, share some highlights of why we thought uh, Tekla is the, uh, you know, the, the person to deliver this uh, lecture uh, this, uh, uh, this year. Um, for those of us who are engaged in peace building activities, peace building work in Africa, her name is not uh, foreign. Uh, she is a globally recognized peace practitioner with over 30 years of uh, experience. She specializes in matters of uh, transitional justice, conflict transformation, social healing, and uh, reconciliation and other uh, related uh, fields. She, recipient of, she is a recipient of multiple uh, awards, uh, including the uh, 2009 Peace Builder of the Year uh, Award that was offered to her by the Center of uh, Justice and Peace at the Eastern Mennonite uh, University. And we have uh, actually just re a few minutes ago uh, we had a nice reunion between uh, a professor and her uh, student, Lisa Shirk, who is with us, and uh, Tekla, who was her student uh, uh, only recently. And they both said that they have not changed. <laughs> uh, so, um, normally, as uh, in these uh, uh, dialogues, and I'll just give you some background of what the, the dialogues, the uh, nature of this uh, event. Uh, for the veterans of us, uh, you may remember that uh, 
uh, we used to have the lecture series, the lecture, and then we went out and continued the conversation outside in a different room over a meal. Because of uh, pandemic, uh, pandemic reality, we are unable to do so uh, at this uh, event. So Tekla will take uh, at the podium and will uh, speak for <laughs> as long as she would like. <laughs> uh, and Lisa will take time. This is what uh, I heard was understood between uh, them. And we will then just uh, follow up with questions and answers uh, here uh, without our regular practice of uh, dialogue over food uh, outside. So without further ado, please uh, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Hekla, please. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, distinguished guests, uh, I must say it's an honor for me to be invited all the way from Kenya. Uh, to share with you this space so that uh, I can briefly share the work my small organization is doing. And the organization is called uh, Shalom Center for Counseling and Development, uh, which is supporting communities uh, from Mount Elgon region of Kenya. Mount Elgon is on the border, is on the western side of Kenya, on the border of Kenya and uh, Uganda, uh, to support communities heal from their uh, traumatic experiences caused by violent conflict. Um, the program is called Sacred Spaces for Trauma Awareness and Healing. And so when I came here, I spent most of the time preparing a PowerPoint presentation. I have this habit of preparing PowerPoint presentations, but when it comes to really time, I put it aside. <laughs> <laughs> and start talking. So for those of you who are interested to see it, um, Lisa, I'll leave it with Lisa so that uh, you can have it. I've also um, prepared uh, 12 minutes, small documentary, so that you can have the visual aspect of what I will be sharing with you. Uh, back to Mount... Elgon. Uh, this is a region that uh, has suffered from violent conflicts since Kenya reintroduced multi party form of politics. Uh, and, the poli and the violence is usually around election uh, periods. Um, the region experienced violent conflicts. Uh, in 1991, 1992, 1997, but the severest of them all were from 2006 to 2008. Then we had some revenge attacks on 2018. Uh, the 2006-2008 violence were very traumatic to communities. Um, the violence, apart from it being politically instigated, is usually around the issue of land allocation. 
this is a region inhabited by some of the indigenous communities in Kenya, some who are living in the forest area, which was a catchment area for, for water. And so the government um, organized for a settlement scheme so that uh, the communities can leave the catchment area to, to be settled elsewhere. But the land has always, the two communities that were supposed to be settled there have had uh, conflicts. So during the 2006, 2008 violent conflict, it drew in a militia group uh, that really terrorized the communities. The, the, militia, the militia group was initially to fight a neighboring ethnic group, subgroup. But as time went on, it turned against its own communities to sustain the violence. So there were restrictions, there were rules. A kangaroo court was set up and some of the rules were you cannot communicate with the local administration because when you do that, you are seen as a broker. You will be reporting them. You are not supposed to uh, do some farming, yet this is an area that depends on agriculture uh, for everything, for livelihood. You are not supposed to, uh, to be seen drinking local alcohol. And if you are caught, you are sent to the kangaroo caught up in the mountain. And so judges were preferred to you. Some people were chopped off their ears because you are not hearing them when they warn you. Unfortunately, some people were killed in the most cruel uh, way using a seesaw. Uh, some had their mouths padlocked so that you cannot continue uh, talking. There was a lot of torture. So there was a lot of trauma. Uh, the military operation had to come in. The police forces were sent there. They were not able to quell this conflict. So the government had to send in the military operation called Operation Okoa, uh, Kenya. Okoa is Kiswahili for saving. And we also know that uh, the military also, they have their own way of investigating. So more torture, uh, more violent, uh, more deaths. In 2008, I was working for Pact Kenya, an international organization uh, on cross-border conflict between Kenya, Somalia, Kenya, Ethiopia, Kenya, South and Sudan. The person I was working with, since she also went through Eastern Mennonite University, uh, Angie Yoda Maina, she understood the impact of violence the traumatic impact of violence to communities. So I asked her for permission to leave my area where I'm working so that I can go and at least create awareness, uh, starting with the women on the traumatic impact of violence. So I prepared my flip charts. I went there and I found a room of 40 uh, women some of them pretty very young. When I reached there, I thought I was going to go the workshop style where I can say, hey, this is trauma. This is the symptoms of trauma. Are you experiencing these symptoms? Uh, these are the triggers. This is the 
coping mechanisms. But when I arrived there, the women had gone through violence for two years and the emotions were very high. All they wanted is to talk about it, to cry, to grieve, to mourn. So I put aside the flip charts and we were there to mourn, to cry, give space to everybody to talk, to cry. As we were doing this, elders were just outside. And whenever we cooked food, we shared with them. So we started with one of the communities where the militia group was formed. After three days of mourning, there was no communication between the two groups in conflict. And I told the women, please, can you uh, select for, for me eight of you? We have to go and reach uh, your sisters high up. They told me, Tekla, we cannot go because since this was 2008 and since 2006, we've been not interacting and we don't know how they were going to receive us. They might attack us. And I told them, according to the African culture, when you have a guest, a visitor, even as a family, you cannot fight. I said, I'm coming with you as a guest, let us go. So I took them. Actually, we had to prepare the way. Their small parts had overgrown. We reached there, I packed them, and I found another, about uh, 30 women in a church. So started the introduction and I told them, hey, guess what? Please, I have some visitors with me. Can you allow them? They told me, yes, when they saw them come in, they all started wailing because they realized there were women from this uh, enemy uh, community. And I had prepared this one. I told them, let them cry, but just please be patient, stay there. They cried and after morning, and I say, my sisters, can you allow us? Can you just, can you allow them to come? They will not say anything, but listen, they came, they listened. And so we had another three days of mourning and grieving and discussing about what happened. So at the end, I told them we need to act. This is the time when most of the young people were in prison because of the military operation. This is the time when uh, most of the people who were killed, some of them had been dumped in pit latrines, in boreholes. And so I asked this other group, can you give me eight of you? So they gave me eight plus this eight, 16 women. And so we sat down to discuss what is the priority. The priority was for the young women to visit their spouses in prison. The second priority, what do they do with the people who had disappeared, still in pit latrines? And we discussed and we said, it's us women to do this. The youth are in prison. The men are scared and they cannot dare point out the pit latrines because if they point out, then it will be seen they participated. But for us, we can be trusted. So we formed a committee and they worked with the local administration. They led the exhumation of a few. That was 2008. Um, so after that, I left PACT and uh, joined the Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Commission. First as a member, uh, later when we had issues with the chairmanship, it forced the vice chair to resign I said, for us, we have to complete this process. I took over the chairmanship, the, the vice uh, 
uh, chairmanship. The issues with the chair forced the chair to step aside so that investigation uh, can take place. I took over and I led the process to almost 18 months to almost completion when the chair came back to finalize. Now, during the truth seeking process, as you know, truth commissions only paint a global picture. You cannot investigate everything. And we were to investigate historical injustices from the time Kenya attained independence in 1963 to 2008, when we had this violent conflict that drew in the mediation of African eminent people led by the late Kof Anan. And so Mount Elgon region was uh, selected as a case study to investigate on issues of ethnic tension and ethnic uh, violence. We finished the report and submitted it uh, to the Kenya government. That was 2013. Unfortunately, the implementation of this report has not taken place. And having taken over the commission, I was the face of the commission. And I knew how this commission re-traumatized the, the people who came before it. I knew how people in Mount Elgon were hurting. And I was so bitter from 2013 to 2018, when I was invited to go to, uh, uh, to go to Berlin as a fellow with Robert Bush Academy. When I was there, I had a moment of reflection. I had to do some small studies and I realized Kenya was not alone. Most commissions don't end up implementing the recommendations. But I said, I can do something, I'm a resource. So I decided to focus on the victims. Then 2018, in the midst of the uh, COVID scourge, I received a call from Mount Elgon. The women wanted me to go there to support them, heal with their traumatic experiences. You would ask, the violence was 2008. They are coming 2020. Well, trauma is like a virus. Once you've gone down with it, unless you confront it, it cannot be, uh, it can, you, you can't heal. So the women invited us there because they said we are hearing youths who might engage in revenge activities. So I went back to uh, Mount Elgon, but you are talking of an area with over a hundred people who are most affected. Individual counseling cannot work. Luckily, when I was working with an organization called Green String Network, we developed our methodology, our African methodology of supporting uh, trauma healing. We had developed materials. In the materials, we have the images. The images, we have stories, the biblical stories. The story of Joseph is very powerful. We have folklore. So we went there in September and organized a circle meeting of 20 women. And using the images, for example, one of the image, there are two baskets. One farm basket, another, another torn basket. And so you just start a dialogue. What do you see? This is a basket. This is a torn basket. What do you think may have led to the basket to be the way it is? Fruits are falling. Some will say, well, it was dragged by uh, a goat. Others eaten by a rat. Others overworked. And then we compare with our own life. When did we have farm baskets? When did our basket start tearing? And what might have led to the tearing of the baskets? And then they discuss their own life. 
and how violence has impacted them. In the first workshop, there was a woman who always sat lonely and others during meals, they could stand on their own. Then we realized that these women were isolating this particular one because the husband during the militia operation was in charge of slaughtering. When you went to the kangaroo court and the punishment was death, she was the one who slaughtered. So out of 20 women, the husband was responsible for the death of all that. When we talked about the story of Joseph and the 11 brothers and how he was to forgive and move on, one woman stood and she said, I didn't want this woman in this meeting because of what the husband did. But we've just realized it's not her mistake. She did not send the husband. And then at that moment, they stand up, they start singing, they go and embrace her and reconciliation will have started. Then when it came for her to share her story, actually when now they caught up with the husband, they frog marched her and killed her, killed him in front of their the children. So these spaces are uh, having a lot of impact. One of them is reconciliation. In one of the meeting, there was a man who kept on asking, am I a perpetrator or am I a victim? And I could tell him, we are all affected. Because I mean, the line between the victim and the perpetrators is very blurred when it comes to communal conflicts. So we told them, no, we are just here. We could be perpetrators, we could be victims, or we could be both. At the end, after narrating the story of Joseph, it happened that he had a nephew in this meeting. And one day, a nephew tortured him because he was in charge of uh, the forest. And when this uncle went there to, get, to cut some trees, he stopped him and I think he jailed him. So he was very bitter. Now, when the nephew had, he went down to his knees, he asked for forgiveness and the man came, they embraced and we danced around. Spaces are also leading to rehumanization of the ex-convicts. Most of the youths who participate, because we identified three categories, the youth, most of them militia and ex-convicts, the widows and the, the elders. As we sit together, the first two days is about mourning, the victims relating what suffered, how they suffered. Now, the youths who are perpetrators, when they are seated there, they get moved. And some of them have come forward to ask for forgiveness because some of them were, for, were forced into the militia, starting the journey of healing and reconciliation. And also, uh, as we continue, when it comes to the women, how they are benefiting from this program is the hope. There is a lot of hopelessness that comes with violence. And some of the behaviors they engage in, they even don't understand. So a woman will say, oh my God, I've been so cruel to my children. I didn't know I was affected. Now I know. There was a man who was vomiting all through when he saw a picture of somebody vomiting because of a uh, a uh, physical impact of trauma, he realized, is this what I've been ailing? The last day he came and he said, the vomiting has stopped. And so these spaces have been very important to the communities. And we only organize them. How the space takes care of itself, we leave it. And they direct us to where they want us to go next. For the elders, they have just realized they had abandoned their role of being custodians of morality in their community. And they are picking up to continue. Then we have an intended outcomes of this. When you talk about impacts of trauma and the cause, you talk about conflict. They are now asking us, to move into community dialogue to prevent electoral violence because next year 
we have elections. Women are setting up support groups. They call themselves peace matters so that they support each other. Youths are calling themselves ambassadors of peace. But of course, you cannot eat trauma. You cannot eat peace. Conflict beats communities into stone age. The poverty level is so high in this community. We had just a circle of 20 women, 18 women. About 15 of them had been raped. Some of them need support, medical support. Those are the unintended consequences. And so we have planned activities, continuity dialogue. We need to support in areas of livelihood. We need to move into other areas because we've just started now reaching areas where we have camps. That is how we discovered women were raped. So this is what we are doing. And uh, I would like now to stop there so that you just view a clip of 15, 12, I mean 12 minutes if you are not so tired before we can open up for dialogue. Thank you. Kenya, like most of its neighbors in the Great Lakes region, has suffered from cycles of politically instigated armed conflict since the reintroduction of multi-party form of politics in 1991. During Kenya's electoral campaigns after every five years, offensive political views from some politicians usually incite communities to fight each other along ethnic lines. Mount Elgon is one of the regions that has suffered politically instigated violent conflicts related to campaigns and land ownership. Communities in this region have experienced armed conflicts since 1991. Tangu <laughs> kwa sababu kuna watu wenye ulikuwa wanaishi alafu hii mwingine alipokuja kutaka siasa akakuja kufurugu kufurugu watu wenye ulikuwa wanaishi na kutolea mashamba na kupatia watu wengine hasa wenye walitolewa mashamba ndio walianza furugu kwa sababu hawakuwa na makao mahali wanaenda ndio wakaanza sasa kuwapiga wenye walikuwa wanapewa mashamba hiyo na sisi tuliweza tulizaliwa hapa tukalelewa tukalelewa hapa hatujui nyumbani kwingine tunaenda wapi that is why vijana wakasema hapana afadhali tufe hapa hapa uwezi mtu uwezi ukaleta mtu kutoka kwingine na kuja aishi kwangu na mimi mwenyewe sina mahali naishi sisi hatuna rasilimali ya kutosha tunategemea tu sana sana e, kulima na ngombe hata ngombe siku hizi hakuna sababu hakuna mahali wanalishia sasa umaskini mwingi ndio imechangia. Mtu akipata tu kidogo aambiwe uwa huyu upewe tu shilingi 10000 unaua. Ukiua hivyo sasa kuna hii kitu inaitwa revenge. Mimi nikishaua familia mtu na hiyo family familia inakuja kuua yangu. Inaenda hivyo mpaka ina affect ulima yote. Tuliweza ku kufanya watu wengi wakaweza kuhama katika mlima huu na wakaenda nje za nje kwa ajili ya vitu ambazo ingekuwa ni sawa tusuluishe haikuwa ni kupenda kwetu kwa sababu tulikuwa tumeshakulishwa kiapo ya kwamba lazima hili litekelezwe from 2006 to 2008 the region experienced one of the worst violent conflicts over land settlement that drew in a militia group and a military operation. Watu wakaanza kuchinjana ovyo ovyo. Watu wakaanza kuchinjana ovyo ovyo, wakachinja wa mama. Tulitoroka hivyo, hata baba yangu ya kunisa, wali mchinja. Mbeke za jeshi silikuja, mazifaru sikakuja, watu wakangamia. Hata mawenzangu walikufa wengi sana. Wengine hawajulikani mahali waneziku. Jeshi, jeshi walipo kuja ya sarakali yeti ya Kenya, waka kuja tena waka uwa saidi. Walikuja kutuwakoa, lakini tena walipika fijana kwanza mimi. 
kijana yangu yenye nilikuwa naye alimaliza form 4 kutoka tu shule hivi na serikali wameingia sasa waulizi wao ni nani walikuwa wanapiga tu wanapiga tu hata kijana alipikwa na na jeshi na wakamua This particular violence was very traumatizing to both community members of Soy and Dorobo. They were left with bitterness, anxiety, fear, anger, humiliation and hopelessness for a long time. Mambo mengi yalifanyika mabaya peke yake. Watu walipoteza maisha, watu wakapoteza mali, watu wakatoroka makwao. Kama mko na vita hamuna amani. Hata wamama hawapati Watoto sasa sasa mse alitoroka mse aliuawa sasa wamama wanapaki yati uh, ya wachane watoto wanapaki yatima tulikuwa na kiwewe yenye ukiwana mtu mwenye alikuchinja unatamana hata rati ikuje mpiga amalisa hata unatamani inji yote yaanguka tu chini na tukufa safari moja kitu ikifanya tu tang unataka ukufe ukiwana kitu watu wamepikana mahali fulani unashtuka una, una watoto shule vile tulitorokea kakameka hatukuweza kwenda kwa shule tulipaki tu anatuambia nyinyi ni chanja wewe amuna makao mahali hapa sasa tukatengwa Shalom Center for Counseling and Development is a non-governmental organization in Kenya that is creating and holding trusted and transformed spaces for healing and reconciliation and promotion of sustainable livelihoods in affected communities one of the Shalom Center founding members, Tekla Namachanja, was among the caregivers who went to Mount Elgon region in 2008 with a mission of creating awareness about traumatic impact of violence to communities. I was one of the people who went there through Pact Kenya to create awareness about the traumatic impact of violence to communities. Actually what we did the entry point were, was women. What we did was to have three days of mourning in one community. We moved to the next community, had another three days of mourning, because that is what women wanted most. After hiyo vita kupoa kidogo, nikawa na mawaso. Jami wangu waliwawa, pajirani wakawawa, kwa hiyo area ikabaki tu wanawake wanawake bila mabwana hata ikaitwa yani area ya wanawake bila wanaume so nikaenda mpaka nikapata shirika ili ya Shalom nikaambia hawa ingeliwezekana simkuje mlima Elgon muongeleshe hii watu maybe wamama wakae kwa amani tekla alipokuja kwa hiyo neno la Mungu kutuletea ya msamaa kumsamea yule aliye kuchinja aliye alikuchalia chinjia wewe mti yako alileta kiti naitwa msamaa umsamee ili kisasi yetu yenye tunasaa kutoka nyuma asipate hiyo kitu akaleta hiyo msamaa akakuja akatufunza akatufunza habari ya kiwewe next year 2022 is an electioneering year for Kenyans. And that is the time that politicians incite communities to fight each other. So the fear of these women was like, if we don't do anything, we might have youths carrying out revenge activities. Kama 207 to Lipigana, 2017 tukapigana hata saa hizi tunaofia maybe utakuwepo tena na eh, na vita kwa sababu makura zimekaribia so many people in this region were affected by trauma actually we are talking of over 100,000 people how are we going to go about it so under shalom center Using materials borrowed from Green String Network, we developed a program called Spaces for Trauma Awareness and Healing. And what we do is 
we go into the community and organize circle meetings. This circle is a meaning. It means to come together to bond. We go nyuma. We are on. We are not afraid. 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 We are not au hataweza tena kuanza mambo ya vita mimi nilikuwa na hasira mingi lakini tangu tuipokee mafunzo haya kutoka Shalom Center Center of Peace ilinipa mpaka wa sasa na vijana wale tulitrainiwa na hawa ikatupa tukaweza kubadilisha mawazo mpaka sasa hizi mimi ni mkulima kidiango pia serikali imenipa kazi za kuvolondia What violence does is to rob its victims' hope in life. The sacred spaces for trauma awareness and healing have led to a great impact in healing, restoring hope, repairing relationships, and transforming the conflicts among the affected people in this community. Kweli shalom umetusaidia sana sana sana. Umefanya mikutano ya amani. Tumetumia hayo mafundisho kwenda kuelamisha hata pia vijana. So, wamefanya kasi ajabu. Kuna mwenye kabisa alichinja baba yangu na namuona na macho. Lakini kwa ajili ya mafunso ya nyetekla, kwa hii kanisa yetu ya shalom kutuletea. Nilipoge ya mafunso na ikanisa itia. Na hata kiwewe ili nitokea. Na nikaansa kufanya kasi yangu. Na nikamuachia makwasa yake. Na nikamusamea. Na nikakule pamoja. Si kutaka nikula nae saani moja. That we are there to hold each other at times when we have such a conducive moment is the time that participants let go of their painful experiences. For the community to find a lasting solution and move on, a lot more has to be done. This starts with bringing on board stakeholders of peace and development. I have a call to make to my fellow peace builders. Since most of us entered into classrooms of peace building trainings, we have become, most of us have become armchair peace builders. Most of us have become professional peace builders. We've set up offices in our national headquarters or in our big towns. While this is very important, there is a lot of work at the community level where almost all the affected are. I've seen the beauty of going back to the community and supporting the healing process. At times, it's a life saving. Wakipata facilitation, waingie kila mahali. Sasa tumeingia kila kila location. Tuingie mpaka kwa kijiji. Wale tuliwaacha nje pia wapate hiyo elimu. Itakuwa tumefagia ama tumepanguza kabisa mlima. Thank you very much for the presentation and for this uh, video.
I appreciated both. And it was interesting to hear the conclusion of uh, the presentation, a call to peace builders. Many of us are, at least we claim to be. And also a call to focus on the community, community level. Uh, it reminds me of some of uh, the work that we are teaching and doing here at Croc with the focus on the community and perhaps uh, the local. Uh, I wanted to ask one question, perhaps we open it up uh, to uh, uh, the rest of us uh, who are here. And that is, uh, since this is a dialogue that involves also the issues of faith and religion, I wonder if you can speak about uh, that aspect of the event and uh, your work, uh, faith and religion as a cause for violence, but also faith and religion as a cause or as a, as a force for reconciliation. Perhaps you can bring that part of the, uh, uh, the issues that we just uh, heard and watched, uh, bring it, put it in the context of the, the issue of faith. Um, I'll speak about faith in the African spirituality, spirit, spirituality. You had an elders talking about before engaging in violence, the youth had to undergo an oathing. How many of you know about the oath? An oathing region. An oath um, is a region where in most of the African context, an animal is slaughtered and parts of an animal are given, they are mixed with medicine and they are given to the youths who are to engage in violence. Then they are bound together by that region. And because we, we uh, practice adult insertion process, a youth is supposed to defend, according culturally to defend the community during the raids. But this aspect is me being now misused in the current situation where the youths undergo a ritual to bind themselves to kill in the name of defending their community over land and you are not supposed to disclose the work. During the session, the youths who went through the oathing ceremony, they said, once you've gone through that, you've sort of become mad. There was a youth, I was told, whenever a person was condemned to die, he cried to reach there to kill. That is not a human being, to kill that. Now, for such a youth to be released, another ritual has to be done. And when I, we went into Mount Elgon, we knew that the youth had undergone that. So for us as Christians, we had to pitch the circle meeting spiritually high. Those places you saw most of them where the meeting is taking place, it's a church. And in that church, we always insisted we have to get uh, a pastor to be among them. Because at one point, the youths who underwent the ritual, at one point after they let go, one of the letting go, it involves spirituality. They come so that the priest can pray for them. We start with prayer, meditation, and reflection. So we ensured that we pitched uh, the meetings very high. We have norms, uh, respect for each other, listening, and, 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 and all that. At one point, we discussed about cleansing ritual. ritual. Again, according to the African culture, according to our norms, you are not supposed to shed blood. When you shed blood, you defile the land, you annoy the ancestors. We believe in life 
after death. And they only, for the youths who shed blood, the only way they could be cleansed is through shedding the blood of an animal to undergo a ritual. So faith and spirituality from that African context. Then we also encourage them to read the Bible. That is why we use the story of Moses. Actually, we dedicate a day to go through the story of Moses, just to encourage them to let go and forgive for those who are able to forgive. We don't force. Forgiveness is very personal. But when they listen, then they let go. And when they realize that actually forgiveness benefits the person who is forgiving, they always embrace that aspect. Prof, I don't know if I've answered your question. <laughs> yes, yes, you did. I wonder mm -hmm. why the story of Moses, what's in the story of Moses that uh, actually mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is helpful for mm -hmm. this practice, if you can. Uh, we are dealing with a community that suffered greatly and lost hope. We are dealing with a community that feels betrayed. The conflict were between neighbors, some even blood relatives. We are dealing with a community that is angry. The story of Moses brings up focus. As much as he was humiliated by his brothers, he was sold, he was taken into prison. I, I mean Joseph. Joseph never lost hope. Joseph never lost to dream again. And Joseph was able to forgive his brothers and reconcile with the family. Our end goal is relationship building and reconciliation. So when they see what Moses went, I mean, Joseph went through and Joseph was able to forgive his brothers, reconcile with them, this has really been encouraging. They just get encouraged. And some end up requesting us to even buy them Bible so that they can continue. We were amazed. There is a youth who said he had never read a Bible. So when we went back, we brought him a Bible. It's an encouraging. What we want is these people to start dreaming again because there is a lot of hopelessness and we can see it in women. Women leave the meeting so energized. I'm now ready to go and continue supporting my family irrespective of what is happening. The youth uh, leave being very hopeful. I know I'm demonized in the community. I'm referred to as a militia, but I know that I've reformed and I'm going to continue living a normal life. Let them talk whatever they talk. So we just help them gain that resilience, gain the hope to continue living again. Thank you. Well, I have many more questions, but I want to be respectful of the forum, which is a dialogue with, uh, with you all. So I'll just open it up for questions from uh, the audience here and also out there virtually in the world. Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I just love the call at the end of the video that you made uh, to uh, peace builders, to uh, the idea that uh, staying in the office is, is good, but also uh, going back to the community is, is most important. Uh, my question is, what actually made you, uh, you know, have that choice to go back uh, to the community level? You could have actually worked in great places, but you decided to go back to like grassroots level and um, help people like uh, heal, uh, you know, from the community level. What drove you back to that, you know, level of community? Um, it's actually my understanding. When a conflict happens, like what happened in Mount Elgon. During the violence, the first uh, years, immediately after the violence, we have a lot of actors coming in to support the communities. And I think I was one of the actors who went there through PACT 
to support. At the end of the conflict, the international actors pull out, the national or other actors pull out, and people think the situation has returned to normalcy. But look at what is happening. The prisoners may have served their jail, they have come back to the community. The IDPs come back to wherever they had reigned. And that is the time when trauma strikes. A woman told me, how do you say we are, okay, we are at peace. When I walk around, I see the person who killed my husband. And each time I meet him, he is wearing his shirt. Another one said, whenever I walk around, I see a man who was in a group that came to pick my husband and disappeared. And when he sees me, he changes direction. So for the rest of the world, this has returned and the people are moving on. But actually that is the time we have triggers. You work a lot. When schools close, their father is not there who is supposed to pay fees, triggers. It, it was my understanding. I have a PhD in peace and conflict studies. My thesis was on traditional mechanisms of trauma uh, intervention and uh, healing among indigenous community, this community that I'm working on. And when I was doing my studies in the university, I could see theses, research papers, filled their gathering dust. And I kept on asking my professors, when are these ever used? So understanding that the community was hurting is what, and understanding the area very well is what made me to go back to the community. And why go in that community? I wish I, I had shown you a, a video of, I mean, a picture of a meeting of peace builders. I'm one of the peace builders. We have a network of peace builders in a posh Westland area in Nairobi. We are analyzing after analyzing, analyzing after analyzing. Very few of us can go into the community. When I went there, I had nowhere to sleep. And also in an area like that, it's the, the way the media paints that area. Nobody can dare go back. It's a militia area. It's a terror area. But it calls for humility to go there. I had nowhere. I had to sleep with the woman who invited me on a three by six bed. Most of us don't want to go that. Most of us don't. We are in too much in our comfort zone. It needs a lot of stretching to go back and understanding the issues on the ground. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. It's really an honor to, to learn from you. Um, I was struck by your comments about um, kind of looking forward to the next election cycle and, and already starting to gather uh, groups of youth, um, groups of women, and wanting, I, I would invite you to tell us a little bit more about how they plan to um, proactively reduce the incidence of violence, um, these groups. Mm -hmm. the, the circle, so far we've, when, when the first women invited us and they saw how successful the circle was, we sat together and we mapped out hotspot areas in this particular region. Violence is all, in many regions in Kenya. I'm focused in Mount Eldon. So we sat together and identified um, 12 hotspot areas identified the most vulnerable, the elders, the youth, and the widows. I, and we planned for that six circle meetings. We've so far conducted 16 circle meetings. And in every circle, they have been uh, identifying their leaders, the five of them. So our next plan is to hold meetings for the youths, all the youths now, the five, 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 
about uh, four of them, the women 555 and the elders, so that now we discuss, because as we discuss trauma issues, we are discussing also issues of violence. So we are hoping that uh, if we get funding, we hold now, we move from circle healing, uh, social healing circles to community dialogue circles. So with these leaders, then we are going to come up with a strategy on how to ensure that we protect our area against incitement from the politicians, because we are now dealing with the anger, letting go, but how can we protect this? So we are hoping that we shall come up with strategies and then it's these strategies that is going to, they are going to inform our next move. We create space, but we leave the space guide us. We never knew that they will need to have committees and these committees are now infrastructure for conflict transformation. And we are going to use that infrastructure, infrastructure to discuss strategies and they themselves will implement those strategies. Thank you very much for uh, your presentation. Um, we are wondering here, um, how has the perception of women and men changed uh, towards their territory, towards the space they inhabit uh, after these processes of uh, reconciliation and trauma healing? You're talking uh, about how communities uh, can better strive together how at individual levels, but, but what about these communities and their territories and spaces? You could comment something on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the approach we took is like focus group discussion. Uh, we are holding separate uh, meetings for youths, separate meetings for the elders, separate meetings for the, the widows. But then I realized, we realized that uh, most of the youths who have been coming before these spaces are men, the young men. But the last circle, there is a mother who came to us and told us, we have so many young people, young ladies who are raped by then, who may also, who also want to be, who might also benefit from this space. You know, we are moving now and we are getting closer to the interior areas where we had the militia camps. And it's around those militia camps that uh, we have women who are uh, raped. And there are also the young people who also pointed out, yeah, you are having us, but there are also young women who are uh, suffering. So we've started, and I'm assuming as we move closer in the valley where we had the camps, we are going to encounter more uh, uh, women. After the dialogue meetings, the series, the, the, social, the, the community dialogue meetings of each of them, we envision them now selecting a few of them for us to meet up there now, a group to look at issues together. They might select a few from the youths, a few from the elders and a few from the women. But for that question, uh, I'm not able to answer it because we've been having homogeneous uh, groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much and for the time and opportunity to come. And I'm a student at the, the Crux School, International Peace Studies Concentration. And during our classwork, we have been reflecting on the intersection between local peace building and the liberal peace building. I was saying to my colleagues that I'm really excited to come to really hear from you. And what I wanted to just share on is 
what are your strategies or what strategies have worked for you best? You know, in terms of localizing peace building, what has really worked for you in the field? And what can you tell us, young peace builders, as to what should we do in terms of localizing peace building? And my last question is, you mentioned funding. And in our class, you know, we also discussed the need for, you know, empowering local peace builders with resources and technical capabilities to ensure that they are able to carry on their peace building work. So in terms of funding, how do you get funding? And how are you able to sustain this kind of amazing work you are doing in Kenya? Thank you very much. Localizing peace building. <laughs> uh, we have professionalized, academicianalized, <laughs> commercialized, <laughs> Who comes from DRC Congo Don't here? Don't point fingers, please. <laughs> <laughs> huh? I have 30 year, over 30 years of experience in this field. And when I'm asked to reflect, when was I at my best? doing this work. I was at my best when working as a social worker, supporting IDPs. I got tired of the IDP situation. I looked for ways understanding why IDPs left their homes. I had a series of meetings with IDPs that was way back now in uh, 1994. After I had a series of IDPs, they sent me to their neighbors to go and find out why their neighbors chased them. I started with the women, they said, no, it's the elders. I went to the elders, they said, no, it's the youths. The youths were still fighting in the caves. I used the development to draw out the youths, ask them, come out, we discuss how youths are in, the child wanted to find out how the youths are involved in development and if you are facing any challenges and what can we do and i knew challenge number one was going to be ethnic clashes because that is when we had our first ethnic clashes after that the youths agreed we analyzed the courses they agreed to meet their neighbors who are still in their camps i used to go and pick the neighbors in the camp bring them we have dialogue heated 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 but they agreed to settle I learned later that I, I was doing mediation. I was doing shuttle mediation. I was facilitating negotiation before I entered into a classroom. And that was my best. After I entered into, my, into the classroom, I'm stuck in workshop after workshop, workshop after workshop. Apart from the truth seeking process where I went into communities again to listen. So me, I got tired of this workshop. If I'm not doing track one diplomacy, what am I doing in Nairobi? If I'm not in South Sudan, or if I'm currently not in Ethiopia, what am I doing in Nairobi? Conflicting communities are aware. When we talk about community, and we don't have now international conflicts. Most of our conflicts now are intra-conflicts. Intra-conflicts are fought in the communities. Reconciliation has to be facilitated. Trauma healing has to be facilitated. What are we doing in Nairobi? What are we doing in Addis Ababa? Sana, I don't know if I've answered your question. <laughs> when, when we talk about funding, <laughs> when we talk about funding, I'm a Catholic who believes in faith. I used my own savings to go and start the first circle we meeting with the women. And after they experienced that, they demanded we sit down and we plan and we reach other areas. We sat down and planned for 36 circle meetings without knowing where the funding was going to come from. Then one day I'm talking to a man of God 
from Catalyst for Peace. And he asked me, Tekla, why, why were you not on this Zoom meeting? I told him I was doing really work at the community. What was it? I explained to him. So what are you going to do? I said, Reverend, I don't know. Then he tells me, go and organize for eight circle meetings. Catalyst for Peace supported eight circle meetings. After the eight circle meetings, then he says, so, so Tekla, what's happened? I said, Reverend, I've finished. He links me to an anonymous uh, partner who then asked me, asks us to facilitate 12 circle meetings. The 12 circle meetings are ending in December. God knows where next. But I have to complete the 36 circle meetings. And for the sustainability of this program, I have to, after the 36 circle meetings, and by the way, the 36 is what we planned. But you go in one area, instead of carrying out one circle meeting for the youths, you get 40 youths. If you just them away, no, you have to organize two circle meetings. So God knows. But for the sustainability, I have to, uh, we have to move into community dialogue to prevent, to protect our spaces so that we don't get involved in violence again. For sustainability, during the circle meeting, I had two, an eight, eight year old woman who was raped. She has been bleeding since then. Uh, 20, uh, 36 who was raped, she has bleed, been bleeding. I can't stay still until I go back and take them to the doctor. Where to get money? God knows. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. But let's do, let's do what we can at that particular point. But I'm also aggressively fundraising. Why do you think I came up with this documentary? <laughs> adopt a circle, adopt one circle. If you adopt one circle, she adopts one circle, she adopts one circle. How many circle meetings can I do? Sorry. No, no, I think, uh, I think honesty is uh, welcome. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we have, are we good with time? Yes. Um, thank you so much, Tekla. Uh, my question to you is on um, the indigenous practices that you're using um, with the rituals. Have you experienced any tensions while you're, while you're in the field um, between, say, people who are Christian but are also trying to uh, engage in the traditional practices? Because I know that sometimes in, in some Christian communities, um, those practices are not uh, necessarily accepted as, um, as good practices. Um, given how things work, and also um, on the indigenous practices themselves, uh, what are there only opportunities? Like, what kind of, what 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 perceptions have you seen when interacting with, say, um, donors or people in your work, uh, and trying to promote the use of those practices? Have there been any negative perceptions, um, and how best can we promote um, the use of those uh, of that kind of a model in in different settings across Africa and even across the world, like it seems that it's it's a very good method that you're using, and it relies on on the practices that are in the community, the structures that are in the community. But how best can we promote that? And what experiences have you had, if any, in trying to promote? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I went for my masters at Eastern Mennonite University. Lisa was my professor. I took two courses, casework and uh, group work related to trauma healing. They couldn't, I couldn't just relate to them. And I asked Professor Barry to allow me to do an independent study on how trauma healing is handled among the African. This is a continent where we don't have counselors. This is a continent where when I am pain, I don't go to Lisa to pay her to listen to my pain. I need a trusted person. I can't pay for you to listen to my pain. And so I wrote that paper. That, re that paper that I wrote at Eastern Mennonite University became my thesis during my PhD training. 
I looked at the role of rituals in trauma healing, the role of the strong we feeling among the Africans in trauma healing. You don't get traumatized as you, when your neighbor is traumatized, you are also affected. I looked at the role of the belief in the ancestors, in the living dead, in trauma healing. And when I went there, one of the questions, and this is an empirical study, I went and interviewed the ex militias the ones I'm dealing with, the ex-convicts, the widows and the elders. And so one of the questions I asked them, looked at the symptoms of trauma, and I asked them when somebody in the community is experiencing, I didn't say these are symptoms of trauma, is experiencing this. I listed people, whom do you go to? One, a doctor, medical doctor, another one, a psychologist, another one, a counselor, another one, a traditional healer, listed. 80% take to traditional healer, the Libons, the shamanistics. Know that Africans believe in the, two, in the two worlds. I am a Christian. I told you I'm a very good Catholic. Yeah? But when my child is threatened with death, and I'm told if you go to this traditional healer, he will subscribe something that will heal my child, I will throw away the cross and go to the traditional person. And so it's the same with trauma healing. Actually, even before I went there, when I was interviewing them, they were already conducting those rituals. And the people who were most traumatized were the youths who went through jail and they did not get, they were too poor to afford a sheep to slaughter for that ritual because when you go through jail and you come back, you don't just interact, you don't just enter into the family. You have to stay away and you'll be cleansed first. The youth who shed blood during the war, they defined the land, so the land had to be cleansed. Elders conducted those cleansing ceremonies with or without our permissions. The youth who shed blood defied the whole community, they had to be cleansed. So we live in the two worlds, and whether we like it or not, these cleansing ceremonies are taking place. And those who are most traumatized are those who cannot even afford that. Because in Africa, you don't just shed, our norms do not just allow us to shed human blood. And once you shed human blood, that blood can only be countered by another blood, a blood of a certain animal. Yeah. And so we are the ones educating. We are educating uh, people to understand this, to understand where we are coming from, to understand our culture so that they allow us to carry out our culture. Because if we don't do that, we believe. Now, if it's one youth who committed that crime, the whole community will be punished. The whole land will be barren. It will not produce unless that uh, land is cleansed. But we also allow, I compare to the traditional and non-traditional, and we allow for those who strong, who believe strong in the Christian faith, they also, even in the church, don't we have cleansing ceremonies? For the Catholics, we have the cleansing ceremonies, that is, we have water, yeah? So for those who wanted to do the Christian way, they are allowed to do the Christian way. Okay. Um, Asante Sana. A tecla <laughs> for for all I mean for sharing with us today and for the work that you're doing. I am from Kenya, and in 1994, uh, 95, I was receiving IDPs from um, other places uh, in in Kenya that were affected by the ethnic cleansing. Um, but my question is, I mean, you're doing really such a profound work in peace building. And um, next year there is elections and I can, I can already feel the um, temperature in Kenya is heating up. And um, I mean, a lot of people are already afraid of what will happen. Um, is there a way that you see uh, your 
work expanding from Mount Elgon to other areas, especially the areas that are more volatile. I'm thinking of Okibira. When I was receiving IDPs, I was living in the slums, oh. in Korogocho slums, and people coming to Korogocho, I mean, that area is dangerous. Oh. And um, they would flee to go from their homes where they were living in peace with each other, and then they are going to slums where it's really, really dangerous. But that was a safe place at that time because they had relatives there. So uh, do you see, um, I mean, not for this, for the coming year, anyway, it's, it's too soon, but do you see uh, um, the sacred spaces growing to to other can I mean other counties, other other, especially the areas where the violence really bruise very quickly. Uh, thank you, my dear Asante Sana. Uh, yeah, next year is not a good year for us, and uh, that is why even this. Uh, I was invited in Mount Elgon because the rhetoric up here by politician is re-traumatizing. You know, the fear of the no. We know that each time we enter into elections, it happens. Uh, funding is a problem. Even in Mount Elgon, the work we are doing is a drop. When we finish, we, we are told, ah, this is a drop in the ocean. And they point out, you have to go there, you have to go there. Funding is a problem. <clears throat> um, but just before I came, we have a forum of uh, peace builders in, in Kenya. So just before I came, we had, uh, we've been doing scenario developments in the regions, Nyanza region, which are usually epicenter. We had one in the coastal, we had one in the Rift Valley, uh, in Nairobi, uh, peace builders, yeah? They are, they are analyzing me, I'm doing Mount Elgon circles. <laughs> so after receiving all the reports, uh, I'm assuming that in the meeting they had almost three days ago, I'm hoping they are going to come up with the strategies, but, I know the strategies, they will all contribute towards peace building. The strategies might be mediation, yeah. Again, the problem is they come too late. For us, we started this work last year. We are doing now uh, the foundation. We are laying the foundation. I, I consider this a seed money. We have identified the issues. Now we just need to put the issues back to the community and then they come up with the strategy. But I don't blame even peace builders in Kenya, even the international partners who support us. Wait next year. Wait until we throw the first stone. You will see so many international partners swimming in to firefight. We've been to firefight until elections, they go back, they wait until five years, they come firefight. That is what the problem we are having. But peace building is not an activity. It's an in initiative and it's circle after circle. You don't know where you are taken next, but unfortunately we don't have partners who can sustainably journey with us. Even getting catalyst for peace. It's just by sheer luck that uh, in, in there, there is a colleague I went with at Eastern Mennonite, Mennonite University who understands trauma healing when she saw what I was doing, then she decided to support. Again, when you talk about trauma healing, people don't relate to it. I've put, we've really pushed, even for this program for us to start here, we've really pushed. It's not an area that is embraced, yet research has shown a relationship between unhealed trauma to a community being embroiled in a vicious circle of violence because of the anger, because of the humiliation, because of the rage. And that is why the youths were really waiting for next year to revenge. 
because that is an opportunity we use to hit at the neighbor. Yeah, so I'm praying, my dear, that uh, others will support, but we cannot be all over. Mm -hmm. I think, are we... Yes. I wish we had more time for questions, but unfortunately we do not. Yeah, and we have plenty more questions. I see 38 eight questions from uh, our online. Uh, we had people watching from Kenya who are up at 1.30 a.m. So they are saying hello to you and we will send you their comments and questions too. Oh my, please, so, can you keep them for me? I want to read them. <laughs> I have uh, many more questions, but I am going to dinner with you. So I'll keep them. Uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to thank you for so many things. I wanted to thank you for bringing in, first of all, I think you, make, you made us all feel humble uh, and really appreciate uh, the kind of work that you, you are doing and that the community is working with you on uh, uh, these uh, efforts. Uh, I think it was really crucial for us to hear about how important uh, the community is and our work within the community is, it was very important for us to hear your critique on the field. Uh, we, you know, as academicians, we engage in that uh, critique uh, a lot in our classes. Our students probably are already fed up with us uh, providing that uh, critique. Uh, but coming from the field and hearing it, in, hearing it uh, from you, I think it's really eye-opening for, for us as professors and for the students. Uh, the really the focus on the local for me is really really and i was i would have been i would have wanted to have another hour with you uh, to to hear more about the local but perhaps also to hear about uh, you know how can we who do not come from your local can still learn from your experience okay. and from your practices okay. because i think this is really important for us as a community uh, in the field who are not coming for your community, but we still would like to learn lessons. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop here just to be respectful of our time. And uh, I invite you all to join me in thank you, uh, Tekla. Looking forward. Now you are in a community of uh, Catholics who uh -huh. know how to raise money. <laughs> hey, hey. One thing about this university. So if anybody here is from development, <laughs> here is an opportunity for you to do something good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I you. feel honored. Thank you so much. Uh, for, <laughs> for the young peace builders. Uh, we are handing over the mantle. Uh, I didn't get your question. I'm still around. I'm at Maurice. Please, if just look around for Tekla, I can I can answer your question. But thank you so much for uh, listening to me. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me in your space. Let us continue with the the dialogue. And in Kenya, we say slowly the egg will walk. Uh, continue praying for the situation back home. We are doing our best and I'm not alone. We, are, we have other uh, peace builders who are engaged in this work and we are all concerned. And even we have the National Cohesion and Integration Commission, the commission that is supposed to foster cohesion. It's also concerned. It has come up with strategies on how to counter those hate speech that incite communities to fight each other. Thank you so much. So we are hopeful.